right. So today I am interviewing Margaret Craig. She is the author of The Young Reader. And I am so excited to have you here today, Margaret. Thank you for joining me. Good morning. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So before I give you a full introduction, why don't you tell me a little bit of the backstory? Why did you write The Young Reader? I wrote The Young Reader because I found myself helping people with their children who maybe were struggling or they just wanted to buy books for them and people would ask me. And I found myself repeating, repeating, repeating and that there just sometimes isn't enough of me to go around because one lesson with someone isn't enough. And then my daughter would say, my friend's uh, child, she wants to know if, if he's doing okay in reading. So I would go and check him, you know, so I thought I need to write all this down and then I can hand someone the book. Not that I wouldn't also personally help, but it's good to have some foundation before I help you. That's right. I completely understand that when you're asking or you're getting so many questions from people who need your help, it's easier to to say it once <laughs> and give and them the tool found on it instead of always starting at zero, you know? Yes. And that's exactly what I think you've done with the young reader is you have given the reader of this book, the tools to help their children learn to read. And likewise, a teacher in her classroom could use these tools as well. But this seems to me to be very much geared toward the parent and how do you, who were you gearing this book to when you wrote it? I was gearing it to parents, but in my mind, I realized and felt that if someone were 30 and didn't know how to read and they found someone willing to teach them, this very book would do the trick. Oh, now, it's for anyone who wants to learn how to read, but I had to pick an audience. So the audience I chose was parents. You know what? I actually love that. I had not even thought about that. So, you know, it's, yeah. I mean, really the, the tools in this book could be used to teach anybody, including an adult to read. And I like that a lot, Margaret. I had, I hadn't thought about that at all. So why don't you tell me a little bit about your background and how you came to help so many children learn how to read? Well, the honest truth is um, I can recall a few situations when I could not help. I'll tell you quickly about one young boy who came to my classroom in fourth grade and when I would give a spelling test, he just wrote letters down. They related in no way to the word that he was spelling, but he knew how to hide what he didn't know, you know, and sit there in a group and act like he was taking the spelling test. And then I wanted to get him into special ed, but he couldn't go into special ed because he moved too often. So now what do you do? You become the one who knows how to help. So uh, when the opportunity came up to be a reading recovery teacher, I jumped at the chance and learned way more than I ever thought was possible. What is a reading recovery teacher? A reading recovery teacher, and um, I don't want them to hold me to my definition, I'll just give you what, what comes to mind, is a teacher who works with first grade students one-on-one -on -one for 60 lessons. Unless, of course, they come to a successful point before that, then, then they can exit the program. And the goal is that when they go back to the classroom, they are an average reader. Many times, because of reading recovery, they're way above being an average reader. And I don't think reading recovery is just for struggling children. It's really for anyone. It's just probably not cost effective to train every first grade teacher in reading recovery. It started in New Zealand. And if I'm not mistaken, all first grade teachers are trained in reading recovery. In the so United States or in New Zealand? In New Zealand. Okay. 
here right. it's it's whatever district will pick up the cost because a reading recovery teacher is a in a continuation program so the nine years that i was in reading recovery every year i went to a conference and every month i went to class for nine years so oh, in addition wow. to teaching one student at a time we also continued our education in a group with other reading recovery teachers and a teacher leader and then oh. This is really interesting. Uh, a couple of times a year, we had to do a lesson, which would be the teacher and the child behind the glass. Other teachers would watch us teach. And then when we were through, the discussion became about what you did that works, what you could do better. And so it was a le personal lesson in unzipping yourself open to show me the way because I don't wow. know everything. You had to learn so much from that experience. That makes, and to help our listeners understand behind the glass, I used to work in a nationally accredited child development center uh, before I was a physical education teacher. And the way that works is it's a glass where people can see you, but you can't easily see them. So the child isn't feeling the set of <laughs> all the child eyes had on no idea anybody was watching us. Yeah. And I couldn't see them either, but I knew. Yeah, you know, and it's, and that when I, when I taught like that, parents, it was open viewing for parents. Parents could come and just sit there and watch and you never knew when you were being watched or not oh. watched. I mean, sometimes you might, see a little something behind the glass, but you just pretty much had to assume people were watching you all of the time. And honestly, that, oh, it was a great experience. I, I learned so much working there, but it's just like you, you know that you know the ed experience because it is unique. It is. It's very unique to just know people can just be watching at any given moment. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so that I just wanted our listeners to understand the child isn't feeling intimidated by all of these adults watching them because that would really skew things. I mean, it skews things a little bit, just the teacher knowing all of these people are watching, mm -hmm. but still, so you've taken all of these lessons that you learned from teaching, but also from having others watch you and critique your teaching and you watching others and critiquing the way they teach. You've taken all of this information from reading recovery and other experiences you've had over a lifetime and condense this. And I want our listeners to know that this book, I, I love it. It is small. It, she has, Margaret, you've really gone out of your way to condense all of this information into a very easily easy to consume manner and interesting manner and you've really given parents true tips to help their children learn and and think that i believe you can do with any book it, it doesn't matter what book is so this book isn't isn't curriculum it's a guide for parents to help their kids learn how to read or to help anybody learn how to read Exactly. So, thank because you for so doing many that. People, they could be the most intelligent person, the, your most intelligent friend. But when it comes to teaching someone how to read, be that way, be like, I don't know. Yeah. Because they learn without having an issue or a memory of it. They just knew how to read. Do you remember learning how to read? Um, yeah, I actually do. I, I, because I really... I think I probably had some skills, but I remember my mom sitting on the couch with me every night in like kindergarten, first grade and reading a book. Now here, let me explain this though. And my children learned in a very different manner. When I learned to read, it was very much your curriculum from public school. You come home and you read out of that book. I really, as a young child, don't recall having a lot of books and oh margaret i wish i would have kept this stuff out i just last night was going through like old sentimental things and i have some of the books where i learned how to read and they're old and they're very meaningful to me and they're and they're sort of 
they're neat books, right? They're just sort of neat. But I read those books over and over and over again, because my parents weren't parents who took me to the library. I think I remember going to a library twice in my entire growing up period outside of say a school library, but I didn't even have access to a school library till middle school. Um, and it's not something my parents did. They didn't think about. And the only reason we ever did those trips was because it was assigned in school. So we walked in, got something and left. And then, uh, so that's how I learned to read my kids reading. I was reading to them from the day they were born. Basically, I literally would sit in the rocking chair before they could even point to the words and just read like good night moon and all of those books, you know, those board books. And I really believe that that's where most of their learning to read came from. But I did use curriculum with both of my kids to help them learn to read. So yeah, I guess the long answer to your short question, is I do remember learning how to read, but but reading those same books over and over again was something I love to do. So even with a limited number of books, I still learned. <laughs> may, I, may I say that that was probably one of the things that made you a very good reader. When you reread the same books over and over and over, each time you read them, you notice something different. Perhaps you learned uh, that quotation marks are around someone speaking. Perhaps you learned that there's a comma before the word said. But when we only read a book once, there's so much that we miss as, as young children. So when you go back, that's why I suggest that in my book that people have a book basket like I have right here. You, uh -huh. you keep a book basket with books in it available for your children to, to grasp at any time, but hopefully most of them are books that they have read before and you want them to read them again because you don't know what they caught last time, what they didn't catch, and then it could be fun. I think if they're reading something they know how to do, you don't always want it to be something new that they have to work at. Something old that's fun that they can actually draw information from that you weren't realizing that they were drawing. Does that, mm. does that answer? Yeah. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Yeah. And you know, I want to say this just so if my mother listens to this episode later, to my parents' credit, they did buy me, you know, the scholastic book orders. I usually oh, got awesome. probably three of those books with every single order. And so I did, I did get to read a lot of those types of books. And I always, I don't know, I always remember reading Island of the Blue Dolphins. And I even wrote a letter to Scott O'Dell and got a response wow. from him. <laughs> so that was impressive. sort of a big deal. Yeah. yeah, as a kid, and I don't know what happened to it. It makes me sort of sad. He even signed the photograph, sent back to me all the things. <laughs> but well, and I'm glad you brought that point up because I would like to let all parents off the hook. It is yeah. not a parent's, uh, a parent should not feel guilty because they don't have a room full of books for their children because mm -hmm. it doesn't take uh, um, volume. It just takes purposeful learning in what, with what you have. And we do have libraries. And, and even in my childhood, we did not have bookstores like Barnes and Noble. And I don't know what are some of the others that I can't think of the name right now. So there was not a lot of available material. And for different reasons, people have more or less in their home. And if you don't have any books, write one. Yeah. I mean, because there is a financial aspect to uh all of what I'm suggesting in the book, as far as having a book, uh, a basket of books, if someone couldn't afford a basket of books, you probably have paper and pencil. So write yourself a little story and teach your child how to read it. You know, th there's really always a way. I love that, Margaret. And you know, when I used to sit there and read these board books to my children, I had so many ideas of my own that for books I would want to write yes. and I didn't do it and I wish I could go back and capture those ideas because I was it like the ideas came to me of a new book I could write <laughs> but let me ask you how did you learn to read well I'm one of those who I don't really remember 
Um, I do remember a few little glitches that I, when I teach, I make sure that doesn't happen to any of my students. For instance, uh, we used to have phonics pages. Not all that fond of those right now, but I remember there was a mat and I didn't know if it was a mat or a rug and you were supposed to put the initial sound. So every time I had to teach a lesson, I made sure everyone knew what ev the name of every picture was speaking wise before they had to know how it looked in print. Hmm. That's one thing I learned. And I do remember we had groups like the red group, the blue group and the orange group and one was smarter than the other and one was a middle reader and one was a lower reader. I wasn't really fond of that happening, but that is how they did it in my day. Other than that, I honestly, know. that's how they did it in my day too. Did they? And that, and you know, if you're the kid at the top of the list, that feels great. If you're the kid that's struggling, that doesn't feel so great. And <laughs> And, you know, I have to say, it's sort of funny. I was a physical education teacher, but I don't think I was born to be a PE teacher. I just have to say that. Um, <laughs> so in reading, I was at that top of the group. But let me tell you, I was like the last kid <laughs> picked for the team in PE. So, you, you know, I think we all get a little bit of the ups and downs. Everybody has their strengths. Everybody has their weaknesses. And let me just tell you why I was a PE teacher. It wasn't because I like loved team sports. It was because I fell into teaching children different physical activity things out of like straight out of high school and adults too. And I thought, well, I love physical activity and I love teaching. So I'll be a PE teacher. Yeah. I think PE teaching is a little different now than I was sort of right as it was sort of changing. Like maybe I could have gone into outdoor recreation, but yeah, <laughs> I just thought I'd share that real quick. Like I really wasn't born to do that. And I know my, some of my teachers had like, well, what are we going to do with Jackie? <laughs> when I was in college. Uh, you know what, Jackie, <laughs> knowing you all that those kids had fun. Yeah, they did. And I think yes. I was actually a very good physical education teacher. And honestly, part of it was because some things didn't come as naturally to me. So I was able to break those steps down oh, yeah. for kids in a way. And I, and I could understand the kids who were like struggling, you know, I could really like, okay, you got a point to where you're throwing, you know, <laughs> so, anyway, but I just thought I'd share that real quick. But so there's something you said in your book that I really like, and it really falls in sort of with my overall philosophy around homeschooling, around parenting and children. And you say something about children being natural learners. Do you want to expand on that at all? Surely. Um, they will follow what they're interested in. And it's a really good idea if we could follow along with that and support that as opposed to like saying, well, it's not time to learn that. Let, let's learn this now. It really takes finesse. I have to say, you know, I never want to give parents a bad rap, but uh, following a child's interest really does work well, which one of the things that you can do to um, sort of keep yourself in line with it, you know, like if their interest is something you absolutely can't do, ooh, you know, but if you have choice, so maybe you can't follow their number one interest, but anytime you can offer a child choice, it, it's a little bit empowering and more interesting for them. And I believe in my book, I mentioned if, if they're not too sure about reading, you know, it's nice to offer them a choice, hold out two books which book would you rather read? Would you like to read this book about the little boy detective? Or would you like to read this book about the boy who loves to plant trees? And then they tell you which. So at least, even, it's, even if it's not their number one interest, it's their choice and they are interested and you will both have an easier time. Does that answer your question a little bit? Yeah, yeah. And you know, I think that is part of what I love about libraries is when you take your child to the library, they have so much choice. And my kids would gravitate toward different areas as they learn to read. My oldest daughter just liked uh, fiction, you know, just stories. My younger daughter always gravitated toward 
the animal books, the snake books, and any animal books, any of them. And that was where her interest was. And they they had different interests, but they both learned to read in their own way. And, and so when the subject matter matters, it's a little bit easier to teach reading for sure. How is that? Well, the subject matter, me being, if they like animals, find an animal book to teach okay. them how to read. If they like um, little princess stories, go find little princess books because there are books on just about everything. And I have heard it said that boys prefer nonfiction. Now, I never like to put anybody in a category, but in general, I think that might be um, true. At least I know it is with one of my grandsons, you know, okay. something to think about. What did you see? What did you see as you taught so many hundreds of children to read over the years? Did you find that to be true in your experience? I would say when I'm working with a first grade child, they are so excited to learn how to read. In the beginning, they're not all that particular. They're, they're really more focused on the words, I would say, and getting it right, which, you know, I kind of always want to steer them into uh, comprehension and checking the pictures. But when it's all new to them, they love everything. But as time goes on and time for a child is maybe, you know, two weeks. Uh, as time goes on, then they start, you can start noticing that their preferences if you give them a choice. And did I notice that boys would prefer um, nonfiction? I'm not sure. Hmm. Okay. I'm not sure, but I've been yeah. told that. You've been told that, but it, you didn't actually notice it so much in your, you know, and I could take note of it. I don't, I don't have as much as it's at the library. It's like, maybe had I had that, they would have chosen that. So that would be more why I wouldn't have noticed it is my, the selection I had for them to choose from. I see. I see. That makes sense. That makes so much sense because, you know, it, as I think back to my own childhood, learning to read in a classroom, your teacher has, you know, maybe one long shelf. I have a bunch right. of books you can go choose from. And honestly, they were presented in such a way that I wasn't overly interested in them because <laughs> all I saw were the spines. You got to show the front of the cover for oh, kids. Yes, I think. pretend you're a bookstore and display the books. Yes. Yes. Like you do in your basket behind you. Yes. <laughs> so, which is, that's a great example. So I wanted to back it up a little bit here to something you said earlier. You mentioned writing a book for your child. And so Margaret and I visited a week or so ago and she was showing me an ABC book and some other books that are homemade. Do you have those available with you today? And maybe you can show us some of those. And I definitely want to talk about the ABC book and the importance of an ABC book, maybe how you might make one and how you would actually use one, whether you buy it or make it. All right. One of the reasons I choose to make the ABC book is because some of the ones I see at the store, they're so full of pictures and it's like, it almost makes me feel like I have ADD when I look at those pages. There's so much on them, not every book, but some. And this is, this is, this is Sebastian's ABC book. And right. each page has the capital and lowercase letter with a picture. This okay. would be A, A, apple, B, B, bird. And let's pause for just a second. So we're sharing this as a video, but this is also going out on the Homeschool Think Tank Parenting Podcast. And for our listeners, each page has an upper left or upper right hand corner a capital upper a left because may i say that it has to be on the upper left because we want our children all reading starts at the left okay i knew the a was but i couldn't in my mind remember whether the b was left yes, or right yes. so i'm glad I just am mentioning because it's purposeful you know i i did mm -hmm. that on purpose okay so a a capital a at the top a lowercase right next to it and then just a picture of an apple but it didn't say apple under it did it no it does not you just point so, to the capital A and say A, then you point underneath the lowercase A and say A, then you point under the apple and say apple. So it's going into their brain this way, A, A, apple, and they're using their finger. 
Okay. If they're reading. I'm glad we clarified that because I, when I was thinking about yeah, all of the different things that we're talking about here and creating a blog post that will go with this interview, in my mind, what we had talked about was that there was the capital A, the lowercase a, the apple, and then the word apple, but I was from my memory. So there's no, not the word right. apple. And you choose, you do that on purpose, on I'm purpose. assuming. I'm not okay. trying to get them to read the word apple. I'm trying to get them to think the word apple and how it starts. So when you say AA, and if they came to a word like at, but they didn't know the word, but they knew the apple and the A in their ABC book there, they could say to themselves, A, A, apple, apple starts at. So this must be at. It's linking. Okay, so I'm just giving them some let's a, a tool to link to when they come to something they need to help themselves with. So let's break that down a little bit more and repeat it for our listeners, because this is a really, in my mind, a really great tool and really sort of critical for them to understand it, yes. because it's easy for me now that I, we visited to connect the dots quickly. And it's clearly easy for you, but if you're just hearing this for the first time, the point of the ABC book is why don't you explain it in your words? The point of the ABC book is for this to help a child to learn. The point like this. of the ABC book is for the children to have a tool in their mind that they can link to when they need to help themselves later on when they're reading. Perhaps if they came to a word, the word uh, book, and they didn't know how to start it, but they knew that was a B. They can think back to this ABC book and think B, B, bird. Bird starts B. So this word is going to start B. That is Excellent. the connection. And I'm going to point out the letter I while we're on this subject. The letter I in some ABC books, they will use ice cream or iguana. And what happens is ice cream is a capital I, so that's not helping the way I want to help. And iguana, a lot of children say iguana. So I needed to know that the, the purpose of this book is so that they know the sound. And so I use the word is for the I, I don't use a picture. So oh. I, I is, so when they come to an I, let's say they are at the word mm, ill and they don't know how to start it. They think about their ABC book which by the way, I hope they've read many times. They think about their ABC book, think about the I, think about what picture is with the I. And in this case, it's the word is, and they say is, ah, the sound of I is I. So then they can go to the word that they're trying to uh, get process on their own and say ill. I How's see. that? Is that an explanation? That's I perfect. Okay. I think that explanation is stellar. And what I'm hearing when you talk about an ABC book is kids just need to be looking at this almost every day as they're learning to read and it, yes. in a fun way, you, you don't want to make it drudgery where they don't want to look at it. You can, <laughs> you know what, at some point, like for instance, children, uh, maybe their attention pan, uh, span is a little shorter because they're younger or whatever. And they usually get up to M and then they're tired and you have to put it away. So maybe another day you might want to start with M. You don't always have to start at the beginning and go to the end. You could start somewhere and then still move from left to right. You're always moving from left to right. You don't ever want to go backwards and give them a confusion. That's what we want to avoid. So, and then maybe someday they can color it. One more thing that since our last interview that I noticed, I came across an ABC book that I saved from a student and I'll, hold it up here just for a quick second. It's uh, an elephant. And when the child would actually learn and know a word that started like elephant, he would write that word on the page. In this case, he wrote every. He also wrote eat and ate. That's pretty advanced because those are unusual sounds for E. But for dog, here's dog. And let's see the words that he wrote are right there. 
to oh. see the children's handwriting, he wrote down and he wrote it underneath the letter DD. And then underneath it, he wrote down, do, did. So over time, the ABC book just becomes more. It's a tool. It's something to link to. It's something to use. I like that. And so the child is really adding to the book and adding their own vocabulary and in essence spelling as well, as long as the spelling is correct. Right. And he writes the word down himself. You could, you could have them make it with magnetic letters first and then write it, but more they do tell you what, when a lesson is over, if you're tired and they're not, you did all the work and they didn't do enough. So just keep that in mind to Put it to them as best you can. Have them make the word uh, if it were down. Give them the four letters for down. We don't want to waste time digging through a bowl of letters trying to find a D and an O and a W and an N. You want to hand them the four letters. Tell them to make the word and then have them write it. So you're guiding, 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 and they are working, working, working. And those are the best teachers, the teachers that guide. <laughs> Not the teachers that do it for you. Hopefully. So. Well, I think so. And you're doing that at the child's level, wherever they are. So let's, let's talk about the magnetic letters. I don't want to gloss over this. So, and also let me just let our listeners know, Margaret mentioned in the last interview. So what happened is Margaret and I were doing an interview. We had some interruptions that made it, now yeah, we would be better off to re-record this. So we're re-recording it for you. And I think that'll be great. And I may at some point take snippets from that other interview and put them on the blog post that goes with this article, the parts that are good. But uh, we've just chosen to re-record it for the podcast episode and make it better. So so we, we talked before, we we talked a lot about magnetic letters and the value of using magnetic letters with your kids. And I also mentioned that we, my, my oldest daughter, especially and my younger daughter too, that we always had bathtub letters. So there was a lot of play with letters in the bathtub too. And really the concepts are the same, but tell us how you use magnetic letters. And I know you sort of glossed, you glossed over it a little bit, but Really, I want parents to leave this episode with some really, if I never do anything else, if I do these three things, these are going to help my child. But I'm here to tell you that Margaret has a lot of value and we're linking to more things on the blog post or the article that goes with this episode. So go ahead, Margaret. Magnetic letters are excellent, especially when your child's small motor skills are not developed yet and they cannot write but they can make words they also have that touch you can feel what an m feels like instead of just what an m looks like so then you have the m sound what the m looks like what the m feels like and then how to use m i'm going to use the word mom just because that's one of the ones children like in the beginning and you can get, here's a, a whiteboard, a little whiteboard, mm -hmm. and it's magnetic. Yeah. I take the magnets to the store with me when I buy a board for um, using this way, because some of the whiteboards are not magnetic and the letters slide right off, just an FYI. Also, I've used a cookie sheet. You can use a cookie sheet. Some of them are magnetic, some of them are not. Again, it's kind of like my point with the book. Don't let finances interfere with what you can and cannot do to help your child become a reader. So if you need to use a cookie sheet, if you need to write letters on paper, go ahead. Uh, but magnetic letters, uh, I use Gershetti, which I mentioned in my book, it's odd spelling. I like, I like the size, I like the way they're made. I like the way they look. The word mom, can be, you could just hand them the three letters and say, here, make the word mom. If they make it M-M-O, you just learned something about your child. You learned that they could start it, but that's it. So another way to approach, you know, you would always say, oh, good job. You got that word started right. You know, always point out what they did right. But then say, now let's do it a different way. I am going to ask you, what letter do you want first to make the word mom? 
they say M. Now I'm going to ask them to say it very slowly like a turtle so you could hear what comes after the M. And I will say, here's how you say it slowly, mom. And then they do it and you ask them, what do you hear right after the M? Hopefully they say, oh, if they don't, you tell them. Then you say, say mom again and tell me what you hear after the O. Mom, M. Then you say, yay, you made the word mom. And for checking purposes, you ask them to run their finger underneath it, starting at the beginning and say, mom. Really, all of this is teaching technique for how to help themselves with all sorts of things, in addition to the simple teaching of the word mom. And so you've said multiple things here I want to pick up on. One, I'm going to, it was one of the last things you just said, running your finger under the word from left to right. Now I'm here to say that while that sounds very simple and very, oh yeah, I, I know that. You know what? If you hadn't thought of it, it's been a long time since you've learned to read an adult. And it's easy if you don't, if you're not using a curriculum or something that points out to you to use your finger to go into the word, it's easy to not do that. And so I think that's a really important thing. If you haven't been thinking of this and you're trying to teach a child to read your finger running under, under that word, like you just said. And some very active children, they will slide their finger under it and it goes right off the end of the page. You know, they go, mom, it is definitely not the way to do it. You want the finger to be under the letter at the same time the sound is coming out of your mouth. So you would say, oh, here, let me show you another way. And maybe take their hand with their pointer finger and put it under there for them and say, see, we want to go very uh, explicitly with the letters. So when your finger is under the M, your mouth is going, mm, and when your finger is under the O, your mouth is going, ah. So let's start at the beginning with your finger right under the letters. Mom. I love that. It and happens a lot that they just think it's fun and run their finger right off the edge of the page. And an example you shared with me last time we talked and you've shared in your book too is the words, I love you, because children don't always understand there's a space. So do you want to explain that a little bit? Yes, I do. <laughs> that, that, um, that will come with time, uh, but quickly that they learn that there is a space between words. They could learn it in a book that you're showing them, if it's one of the very easy ones, or you can very easily make I love you out of magnetic letters. And another thing with these whiteboards is the dry erase marker comes in handy. So you can write, I love you, maybe an exclamation point for an additional teaching point and have them, they can point to the word. They don't always have to point under each letter. Those are like two different lessons. One lesson is to see how the word is made when you would go with your finger specifically under each letter and slide from left to right. But in a case like this where I wrote, I love you on a whiteboard, they just need to put their finger under the word, I love you. So that they get to know that speech actually has spaces in between it. And that's why books have spaces in between the words. They just maybe didn't put that together on their own. Once you point it out, it, it doesn't take long, but you do want to make sure that you point it out. Now, the way that works is if you're reading an early easy book and you do a little bit of word locating, which is another little strategy. Let's say you're reading a book about um, a cat. The cat is on the table. You, would you point to the word on? Put your finger under the word on. So they're, you're knowing if they memorized it and don't and aren't really actually reading it, or if they know that they are, if you know that they are reading the author's words. 
because children are yes. so smart. They can just, you could read them a story and they could read it back, but they're not using the author's words. And it's just a little shift that we want to make with them so that they are reading the author's words. And again, back to your question about the space. If you do a little word locating when you're reading a book, say, before we start this page, can you find the word cat and put your finger under it? Just to add a little oomph. Does that make yeah. sense? Mm -hmm, it does. So I think there are um, two, maybe three other short things that I want to mention, and then we'll wrap it up from there. So there's something I'm, I forgot to mention early on in this interview that I really like about your book is you are approaching reading as problem solving and teaching. You're trying to give children tools to solve their own problems while they're reading. But what you've pointed out so well in your book is that maybe not the exact tools, but the concept of problem solving for yourself is transferable to so many other areas of your life. And I've never really thought about reading as problem solving or transferring that to other areas of life. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Ultimately, I would like a child to say in their mind, what can I do to help myself? I'm stuck. What can I do? It's like a response that to being stuck that has a lot of opportunity for expansion. So what can I do to help myself? Maybe at the early stages, they might think, I'll go to my ABC book and I'll go look at that picture of an elephant and see what letter is with it. Or um, how can I help myself? I might say it slowly. Maybe I'll run my, run my finger under it. In the very end, if what they do to help themselves, I want them to know that one of the things they do to help themselves is to ask for help. I don't want a child to ever think that asking for help means that you're not smart enough because asking for help means that you are smart enough to get help because you want to know what you want to know. That's right. Boy, that is, and that is a true lesson. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm here to tell you homeschool think tank. I've had to ask for a lot of help <laughs> and I've had to problem solve a lot on my own. It just, in founding this company and doing all the things that even what I'm doing with you today, right? It doesn't just happen. It go, it's a series of problem solving steps to get to this well, point. Had I and not for you. Um, had a problem in the last interview with some background noise, I wouldn't have learned everything I've learned since then to yeah. avoid it. <laughs> yeah, well, and you know what? We're, we're always learning and we're always problem solving. So um, something else, uh, there are two other things and I'll just mention them both and let you bring them together as you will. So there's one sentence that you say in this book, in your book, and I think it was on page 69, I'm thinking, let me see here, 68. Okay, so you say, can you get that word started? Just might be the single most important question to ask your child if they get stuck. If they can't get it started, find out why it could change your child's life. Let's just stick to that one point. Well, the entire... And I think... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. The, the, the entire process of reading is working from left to right and then going back to the next line and working from left to right and going back to the next line and going from left to right. So knowing where to start is necessary. If you start in the wrong place and move from left to right, you're not going to get what you need. You have to know where to start. You have to know where the page starts. I've had children read a book before lessons and they would start on the right-hand page instead of the left page. So knowing where to start isn't only about words. It's always knowing where to start in, in the act of reading. 
but by asking them if they can get a word started, you know if they are looking in the right place. I talk about one child who was stuck on the word help and she said play. And uh, it's so help backwards, P L E H. She said that she said the word play. And I, through asking her questions about why she did that or why she got stuck, did she check the picture? She was very smart checking the picture and getting the letter started sometimes get the word because if they can start the the word get the sound of the first letter and look at the picture and they're understanding the story they can get the word from that alone but the reason she could not read the word help was not that she didn't know where to start the reason she couldn't read the word help was that she did not know the sound of h so when I went to that question, can you get that word started? She just looked at me and said, no. And so there was no mixing up letters in her brain or anything like that. It was very simple. I don't know the sound of H. She didn't know that that was her reasoning. You know what I mean? I, it's my job to analyze and figure out how to help her and why she isn't reading the word that's on the page but that was it. So by asking, can you get that word started? You learn a great deal about their processing. Yes. And I want to mention this while I'm thinking about it. Margaret is giving away a few copies of the young reader. So we're going to do one drawing a month for the next four months. Is that what we decided? I believe we did. Okay. So when you click the link that goes with this podcast episode, or if you're watching the video, you will find a link that goes to the article that goes with this and you can register to win a copy of that book there. But I'm here to tell you, if you need the book, I think just go get it, go get it quickly. And then if you win it, give it to somebody else. <laughs> because, because to me, the tools that you're going to learn in this book, if you're going to, if you're helping a child learn to read, the sooner you learn them, the sooner you can help your child move forward. And every day matters, just every day matters. And it matters in their confidence. And that is actually leads me right to the last thing I wanted to talk about that I really like in your book is you're really pointing out the, the power of praise, really of praising your children in your book. So tell me a little bit more about what, we all know what praise is, but what makes praise meaningful to a child? First of all, they listen to what we say usually and praise feels good and they will remember what we praise. Actually, they will remember what we say. So if you say, I love the way you got that word started, it will make an impression on them that, oh, she likes when I get the word started right. I think I'll do it again. As opposed to, well, I shouldn't say as opposed to, but I am. I did say in the book that criticism is shooting yourself in the book and you're in the foot. You don't have to believe me on that, but it is a fact. Criticism has no value, especially in learning how to read and probably in life. Just get to the point of what somebody does right and they'll wanna do more right. Yep. And they will repeat what they did right. Like, I like the way you turn the pages on the book so carefully that the book stays in good condition. They want to make you happy. They want to do what's right. If we don't, when we criticize, we cause confusions about what is it she wants? I'm not sure, you know, but when we praise, they know what we want. You know what? And I have, so since I've read your book, and I have, I have a business coach that I talk to every single week to help me with homeschool think tank, because I started from nothing. I, I had never, I didn't know how to run a business. I didn't know how to start a business. And over time I realized I need some help. And so what is funny is I've started recognizing where he praises me at times and do you know what? I'm nearly 50 years old and that feels good. Awesome. And honestly, it's funny. I don't really realize. I thought, I don't think I hear a lot of praise very often. And, and it feels good. 
And so, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm thinking back to your book this in this last week, I literally in the moment he did that, I thought of your book and I thought, my goodness, that is so true because if it feels good to me at 50, almost not quite I'm a few years, but close how good that feels to a young child or to anybody else for that matter. Everybody likes to be praised. We all like to hear the good things about ourselves. It is just being human in my yes. opinion. Yes. And being specific with praise kicks it up a notch. I've had my child say to me, oh, you just say that because you're my mom. So that's when I go back to what I even wrote myself. Doggone it, I wasn't specific. So I have to say, oh, I really like the way that you took the garbage out and I didn't even have to ask you, how nice. You know, you want to say every, things other than, oh, you're such a nice kid or what a good job. Those are good, don't misunderstand. It's not that we want to eliminate them, but when you get specific with your praise, you're just kicking it up a notch. And, you know, and Margaret, I find this is something I can improve a lot as a parent because I tend to be very straight to the point, very matter of fact. I'm like, great, we got the good things done. Let's move forward. <laughs> and I, and I don't always take the time to celebrate my wins or other people's wins. And I don't always take the time to praise the great things. And it's something I, you know, well, I might. I'm writing this down because I'm going to do this the moment we're off here. And maybe our listeners will do this too. Um, alarm. I'm writing this in my notes. So here's what I mean by alarm. Set an alarm in your phone for three times a day. And you don't have to write praise in there. You can put some code word. And when that goes off, make it, make it, take a mental note and find somebody around you that you can praise. I, don't I love it. Calling your mother and saying, mom, I'm so grateful. You sat on the couch next to me all those years read with me, or it's with your kids right there saying, thank you for taking out the garbage. But I've used that technique of setting an alarm to remind myself to do things for creating new habits in my life or breaking bad habits and creating new habits. And this is one I'm going to do it. It's great for me it. too. Yeah. 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 You know what? And that's the truth. You look at your, look at your spouse, look, look at your partner and find the good. And I, I have to, I'm going to toot my own horn here. I did that last week. I knew my husband was having a tough week and he was about to go into some tough meetings. And I sent him a text. He was seven hours away, but I sent him a text and said, Thank you for all that you do to take care of our family and all of these things. And you know what? I haven't done something like that for a very long time, but I, I was, he, I'll bet he appreciated it. He did. He did. And you know, I need to do it more, right? I need to do it more. Cause like I said, I'm tooting my own horn. That was one moment, but I haven't done it for a really long time. <laughs> and the funny thing is we're doing it for them, but what happens is you we can't good. help but be happier ourselves. It just is a win-win. It is. It absolutely is. Margaret, thank you for coming back and doing this interview with me again. I think it's even better. I may at some point pull out some of the snippets because there are things that we did talk about in that other interview that we didn't hit today about sight words. And I talk about some of those things in the article that I've already started writing to go with this interview. So you can get some of those nuggets if you're listening just by going to the article. And remember, if you want the opportunity to win one of Margaret's books to visit the article, also I'm going to be linking to ABC pictures that you can print off and do at home to make your own ABC book with your kids that Margaret has already put together. So there's a lot of resources is what I'm saying. And let me mention this to our listeners and Margaret, I haven't even shared this with you yet. So I recently rolled out something new on the website where you can search the homeschool think tank parenting podcast. You can literally type in the word reading and pull up every moment I've ever said in over a hundred episodes now where I say the word reading and it brings you right to that moment in the podcast episode. 
Well, that's wow. going to happen with this interview too. And it will happen with the video and with the audio. So you can read it. But if there's something we said in this episode, you can go to the website, type in that word, and it will pull you right to that moment in our interview. So you can get those gold nuggets that you're looking for really quickly. So I think, I think our listeners are going to love it. And I think you'll like it too. Oh, one to last try. thing. Yes. I, I want to mention for our listeners, and I showed Margaret a little bit of this. I found on the Library of Congress website, a really old ABC book, like from the 1800s. It's really neat. I like things like this. So definitely check out the article to see that because it's cool. It's, and you can read it like with your kids. And you know what? I think, so I did one where I read it out loud. I think I'll do another screen recording video where I'm not reading it at all, but I'll go slow. So you can actually read that with your children if you want, because it's neat and it is an old, Good idea. old book. So yeah. And um, anyway, so check all those things out. Do you have anything else you want to add before we close? I just want to say thank you. And if I haven't covered something important and anybody has a question, I'll, I'd be happy to answer. Well, thank you. Thank you. And Margaret, I'll send you an invitation to our Facebook group so you can join that. And we can always do a Q and A in there if you want to. So, all right, that is it for this episode.